Everybody, we got them back again. The Babe Ruth is back. The Babe Ruth of Tennis Con every year knocks out of the park. Amazing presentations. This year, no exception. Tonight's live stream, going to be amazing. And then remember, if you're a member, you got an email. Did you get my email? We're doing a members-only live stream at 9 o'clock, too, because we're giving our members more value than ever this year, Jorge, and you are a rock star. Thank you for coming on. How are you doing tonight? Great, guys. Nice to join you. Uh, thanks for the invite, Peter. Yeah. We got Scott and Sharon Levy. Now, Sharon came to TennisCon Live with us, uh, oh, yeah. Jorge. Yeah. And remember, guys, when you sign up and get a lifetime access pass, you get into the raffle to win a free spot. And Scott Levy just got back from the Tennis Fantasy Camp in New Brunfels, Texas. I don't know if you heard of this, but you play for the Legends. And he was the MVP of the week, went undefeated, and was the last match on. 100 men watching him play, and he pulled it out in the third set, 10-point tiebreaker for his whole team to win. How awesome is that? Nice. Clutch. Clutch. Geraldo is here. Neil is here. Mark, he's just always on. He's an amazing. He's all over. He's been sending me videos, too. Sorry, yeah. I sent you the wrong link, Kyle. You're here now, baby. Got 10 junkies is here. Okay. So, guys, it's great to see you. I hope you're enjoying Tennis Con 7. It's been pretty amazing content. I've been watching it, of course, all the way through. And um, how are you feeling tonight, Jorge? Good. I'm pumped. I had some uh, some good time this uh, afternoon to kind of go over the what I wanted to present. I think it's going to be cool on the technical side. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, uh, we're going to break down that for him, man. Yeah, if you guys don't know, Jorge Capistani is a master USPTA and PTR pro. There is less than 1% of pros in the world that can say that. So you guys are in good hands tonight. And a lot of times we've been talking about tactics and strategy, but this year Jorge is going over technique a little more. And tonight we're going to focus on the forehand and talk about checkpoints. Before we get into your presentation, what are checkpoints? Why are they important? And, yeah. and how do you teach them? Yeah, so a lot of times, you know, when a coach is looking at someone's strokes, whether it's forehand, backhand, or whatever, um, the student might be wondering, like, well, what, what are they looking at? There's, like, all these moving parts, and is there, like, a, a general thing? And most good coaches work with a system called checkpoints. So along the way, you check for certain, you know, parameters at certain parts of the swing. And um, once you have your checkpoints, then you can kind of – diagnosing becomes a lot easier. Uh, otherwise, you're just looking at this big – giant swing of a forehand uh, so i'm going to show you the six checkpoints most of these checkpoints peter are pretty universal not every coach will say that the that my six checkpoints are correct but i think most do uh, these were frankly come up a lot like our buddy uh, mark kovacs is a good friend of mine he's got a lot of scientific stuff behind the checkpoints particularly in the serve today we're talking forehands you're going to see they're pretty generic most coaches would agree they might name them a little bit different or maybe a coach has seven checkpoints instead of six but uh, the, the whole point is you really could use checkpoints to kind of check yourself um, and know where you're where you are and what i want to talk about today uh well, specifically it'll be about the forehand checkpoints but generally i want to just talk about the dangers of technique and maybe share some of the stuff i learned over the years uh, how to get people to actually make technical changes that stick mm -hmm. in our industry we have players who we love and unfortunately a percentage of players are stuck making the same technical adjustments for literally sometimes a decade yeah on that i've been working on my forehand and taking private lessons for like nine years and i'm like man something's got to give so i think i know a lot of things that people do to sabotage themselves so you got to have some technical knowledge. we got to be smart about it. So we're going to cover all that stuff, and I'll show some good examples, I hope. Yeah, oh, you absolutely will. Uh, guys, definitely stay on this if you're like checkpoints. I've kind of heard checkpoints because Jorge, we went through his presentation before he got on. It's it's pretty unique presentation, and there's a lot to think about. You know, So it's just not about going over the checkpoints. It's <clears throat> really you know, then how do you work on these? How do you get out of this rut? So I think you're going to learn a lot. Um, Tom Nordstrom says, hey, Pete. Hey, Jorge, I'm in. I won Jorge's book last mm -hmm. year, so that's right. I do send out the book, so this is the book. And actually, guys, 
I have 10 copies. So when we go over going uh, and getting lifetime access with Jorge's link tonight, because he's got some really cool bonuses, the first 10 that upgrade to lifetime access, I will send you out a book. Plus today, if you guys don't know, if you didn't see my email earlier, it's Towel Tuesday, baby. So everybody who upgrades gets a towel sent out. Remember, you guys got to email me your address when you sign up. Otherwise, I'm not a psychic. I don't know who to send it to if I have no address. All right. So, Jorge, we're going to go to about 8.40, 8.45-ish on this. So okay. we got to jump right in. And uh, let's go right now. I'm going to put your presentation up, and I'm going to let you just take the wheel and drive. Okay. Sounds good. All right. I think I see it there. So let me just kind of keep going. The forehand technical checkpoints. Uh, let's get going. So first, I want to just, before we go deep in there, and I know a lot of people watching love technique. That's all you, you're addicted to it, some of us. So let me just talk about, I want to explain the concept of some of these things here. I'm going to put up, uh, what do we got there? Six, maybe? Yeah, six. The range of acceptability. Uh, part of what I wanted to show you in this presentation is that there is no perfect technique. Uh, you take the top 10 forehands in the history of tennis and they'll look slightly different. But there's a range of acceptability, right? And then there's then sometimes you're outside that range. So I like that phrase, range of acceptability. Uh, you're going to learn that diagnosing errors is way easier than fixing them. Diagnosing, I'm, I think I can teach most of you tonight how to diagnose some strokes. If you got a, a phone, you can do it on yourself. The tougher part is fixing it. Oh, let's go back. Skill acquisition and competition. This is where a lot of people get stuck. I hate, well, see, frankly, because as a younger coach, I wasn't very good. And I had a lot of people stuck on their technique. I was giving them, and I'm like, I don't know what's wrong with that. Sally here can't get it. But, man, I'm, you know, I think I'm giving a good lesson, but she's got the same issue year after year. Uh, we'll talk about the four stages of competence and how you might use that. Um, we'll talk about using video analysis and a little bit about the truth. So, um, here's the first thing, this big idea of the range of acceptability. You have to determine what is style and what is substance. Some people just have a style thing and it's all okay. Other thing is substance, you got to change. So I'm going to put some images up here. The, the concept we're looking at is the preparation, the, the first part. Okay. So I got four people's forehands here. You, you recognize these guys? Oh, yeah. You got, Federer, you got Rafa, you got... Um, Nick Kyrgios, and you got Dominic theme. okay? So you would look at that. They're all kind of in that coiled, what I'll call the unit turn, the ready position, or, you know, that first one. Um, but at first glance, you say, well, I see some similarities, but let me just point out, I'm going to put some arrows here. Look at where his rack is pointing. Look at where Rafa's. Look at where Nick's is, and look at where Tom is. Now look at those arrows, and they're going in all freaking directions, right? In that position, that unit turn position, it's different. Look at how high Kyrgios's elbow is compared to Rafa and compared to Roger. Yet, what do we know about Kyrgios' forehand? Is it a bad forehand? No, it's like one of the best forehands on the planet. So I show this as one way to describe to people before we get deep in technique that, listen, don't be chasing the shiny object. you got to have technique that's reasonable but don't try to you know you can't copy uh rafa necessarily because you might be better off with a federer technique or something like that so there's lots of stuff in this so that's just preparation right so let's look at another example this time we're looking at follow through okay so here's roger here's a follow through here's a follow through and here's a follow through that's federer nadal jack sock and ernest Golbist. so what do I look at here? So let's look Look at these circles here. Look at his hand. Look at his elbow. Look at his hand. And look at his hand. Every freaking thing here is different. This is the follow through. And some would say that Jack Sock thing on the left, lower left, well, that can't be right. Look at how he's got his, his rackets finishing towards the ground. That can't be. And then you might say, well, Rafa, yeah, I guess Rafa's Rafa. So anything he does. But is that a proper finish? Is Federer finishing around, wrapping around the shoulder? Is that good? How about Ger Ernest Golbus where he finishes like a like he's doing a touchdown thing? So, again, another piece of evidence I hope to show people that there is 
no, in my opinion, perfect technique. There's better technique, but um, I think it's, this is my way of kind of proving that there is a range of acceptability because all these people are millionaires playing tennis. Okay, so what's the bottom line when it comes to range of acceptability? Uh, you gotta, you need to help uh, what it is. Some of you watching tonight, your range of acceptability is super narrow. It's gotta be this or not. And you're fixing things that don't need to be fixed. Uh, another thing is you gotta determine what between, if it's substance or style. So style just means something that you do that is okay. Substance is like, no, we have to change that. Um, three is be aware of technique addiction. I had this a little bit when I was a young player. I've had many students that are total addicts to technique. They just think every error and every loss is only because of their technical flaws and they ignore the other areas. So those are the big three. Okay, uh, let's keep going. I'm going to tell you this analogy that works for me. Um, a doctor analogy. Diagnosing is easier because you got checkpoints and use video analysis. And I hope to show some examples. And I think a lot of you, even tomorrow, might be able to go and look and, and compare yourself. The fixing is more difficult. Okay. It takes time. It takes experience. Um, there's a lot of corrective measures that have to happen. Um, a couple pieces of advice for you. Let's go back to this doctor analogy. If I were to go to an actual doctor, my doctor, and I got a sore throat, okay? Maybe it's your coach. And the coach looks at me or the doctor looks at me and, and you know, checks me out. And he says, oh, yeah, I took a swab here, Jorge. You definitely got strep throat. So you got to take this medicine, okay? So the second he gets the results from the swab, he has diagnosed me, okay? He's identified the problem. But that's not the minute that it's fixed, right? There's a process after that. So I get the diagnosis, boom, strep throat. Then he gives me some medicine. And then I got to go through the process of taking that medicine. You know how they say, take the whole thing. Don't just stop when you feel better. You know, take it till it's all gone. Um, and that's kind of how tennis is. People get the diagnosis um, and then they just don't do the cure or they start on the cure. Okay, my coach said my forehand is messed up because I'm way too risky. He's giving me some things and then you do it for a day and then you got to match. USTA match. Well, I can't do it now. So you go bump and back and forth and, you, and it drives you crazy. So this is kind of something I, I hate to see people suffer through. Okay. Uh, a couple things. It's a process, you know, just like the cure, the diagnosis can be quick, but the cure rarely is. Uh, you need to take the medicine, right? You can't just take one pill and say, well, I can't take the pill tomorrow. Uh, you got to stick to it. Um, you got to allow some time to succeed. I don't know how to spell succeed, evidently. <laughs> um, and outpatient versus general surgery. So what do I mean by that? When you make a technical change, this is my doctor analogy again, I will tell someone straight to their face, okay, we are changing the grip on your serve. And this is not outpatient surgery because you play for 40 years and you have a lot of muscle memories. This is going to be general surgery. It's going to be a while. You're going to have some recovery time. Other people, I might have to just change their swing path and I say, you know, it's kind of outpatient. I can probably fix this and I can diagnose it quickly. We'll get going on it in a couple of days time. You should be able to get it. But all of us want every technical change to be outpatient. And some of them, frankly, are not. You know, if I'm teaching someone a major different thing, and especially if they have a lot of history doing it one way, that would be maybe uh, general surgery and it's going to take a while. Okay, let's keep busting through this. Can, can I just stop you for a second? Yeah. Where do you think of all this stuff? That is that is like genius. I love that outpatient versus general. And it's so per, it's so right. It is so right. And I think being able to identify, you know, where you are with things, because that's when it gets tough, because a lot of people, why they're online and why they're trying to go through this conference is they don't necessarily have a, a system like uh, a junior development system that they're in, where they, you know, go to the academy four or five times a week. And they basically have somebody making sure that they're on the right track but anyway right. just so you guys know uh jorge is not a real doctor he just plays one on the tennis court all right anyway go, go ahead yeah so that analogy you know everybody goes to the doctor right so I, that analogy has worked well for me over the years with my students okay let's keep uh let's keep plowing over here so now i'm going to talk about this one of the things i hate most that people suffer through it's uh sabotaging their technical changes right you get started, I'm sure people watching, there's a, a percentage of you will say, yeah, 
you know, man, I've been trying to fix that stinking whatever forehand or my backhand volley or my serve, whatever it is. And it's, I'm on year five. I just keep dabbling in it. So let me just show you. And by the way, when I used to do a lot of private lessons, I would sit with the families and go through this. Okay, so now I'm going to show you four modes. I describe these as modes. Uh, one mode is learning mode. Okay, that's one that the skill is new. You're not very confident. There's no competition. Okay, uh, so let's use an example. I got a young kid. He comes in. He's played a little bit, and he wants to switch grips on the serve. Okay, so he's going to be in learning mode for a while. And learning mode should be defined like that. Now you have training mode. Okay, a weekend, two weeks in, I say, okay, you know, you're, you've kind of learned it. Now you just got to practice it, training it. So in training mode, you're going to be gaining confidence. You're not going to be as scared of it. And you can do point play in practice. You can start putting the beginnings of a scoreboard. Would you want to put a scoreboard on it when you're in learning mode? No, because you're asking for trouble. That's a hundred percent perfect way to start, you know, oh, I can't do it because you're worried about winning. Okay, then I have this is all my language, so you know <laughs> stick with me here. I have non-official competition mode. So now what this means is your this skill is ready for match play. It's not official. It's not a tournament. It's not going to be in your permanent record. It's not a lead match. It's practice matches. But now, you know, you see how you're easing towards it. You've taken this new skill, and you're kind of going through these modes. And then finally, you go to official competition mode. And this is like it's ready for deployment. And you're going to play, and it's on your player record. Okay? So it makes sense when you walk people through that. This is for any technical change you're going through. I said serve. It could be whatever. But here's what really happens. Uh, someone comes and they go, oh, can you help me with my forehand? Uh, I really, I got a lot. And the coach starts helping them. And yeah, okay, it's kind of a lot of work to be done here. And then instead of going through the phases, they'll do it. And then within two or three days' time, maybe a week, they're off playing a USA match. They jump right to four. And the thing's not ready. Your new baby forehand with the new that you're doing is not ready. It's screaming, don't do this to me. I'm freaking out. And you choke it. And then you go, oh, I suck. What's wrong with me, Jorge? I, just, I don't know why I can't pull my crap together. I must, must be a chump. And then you go back to the coach. You do learning mode. And maybe you go here. And then, oh, I got to play a match. So this screen could be the most important screen of the whole thing. Uh, we haven't even talked about technical, but so yeah. many people, in my opinion, Peter, just get this wrong and they're stuck in this thing. So ask yourself, if you have a technical issue and you've been dealing with it for more than a year, some of you 10 years, it's likely you're caught up and you're not going through the process. So oh, people, Okay. Can I stop ahead. you right for a second? So I would love, you know, the more interactive you guys are and the more you're honest, like take a moment and think about it. And write down, you can either write down one, two, three, or four. Are you in one learning mode with your forehand? Especially if you want to like change, like maybe you're trying to learn a new, a new forehand. Maybe you're trying to get more topspin. Like if you're trying to learn something new on your forehand, where are you with your new thing you're working on? Are you in one, two, three, or four? Because most of you are probably not like you've never hit a forehand before, but you might have a new project you're working on right, where you're trying to make a new implementation, where are you in that process right now? And write that down, because I would love to know. But uh, anyway, Hori, this is amazing as always. Continue. No sweat. Yeah, so that's a, a big takeaway that I hope people kind of get. All right, let's keep plowing. Um, here's the four stages when it comes to, I'm going to use a grip change here. So these are not unique to me. This whole four stages of competency, I didn't make that up. It's people use it all the time. So stage one is unconscious incompetence, meaning I don't even know that I'm doing it wrong. I show up to Peter's camp. I got a weird grip. I'm swinging the wrong way. And Peter said, did you know that your forehand should be doing this? And I'm like, no, I didn't even know that. So that's unconscious incompetence, right? And then if you stick with it, you'll start working on it and you start to become conscious incompetent. So now what happens is you know that you're not, now I have knowledge. Okay, before I didn't even know that my forehand was wanky, now I know it's wanky, at least intellectually I get it and I'm gonna start the process. 
Then you go to stage three, which is conscious competence, which is it starts to work, You're becoming better, but it's not automatic. Conscious means I have to think about it all the time. Oh, crap, I forgot. I got to. I can't chop it like that. I got to come over it like this. I got to remember to point my elbow or whatever the tip may be. All right. Um, and then the last stage is unconscious competence where that skill is basically automatic. Okay. So I have at the top of the page here a grip change on the serve. I've done a lot of grip changes on the serve. And usually this is how it goes. Tonight, before I came here, we had a serve class at, the, at my club at 7 it started. I took some film. I'm going to be analyzing those kids. But a lot of them were at stage one. They didn't know they had the wrong grips. I showed them nine checkpoints. They were like, what are these? So they were definitely there. And now today, probably by the end of class, they're at stage two. And then they're going to work, and hopefully in a few weeks' time, they're going to be at stage three where they're, they're getting it, but it's not automatic. And hopefully by the end of the session, they're at stage four. They don't even have to think about it. Um, so I just apply that principle of conscious, unconscious, competence, and incompetence to tennis because I think it's the, – the purpose, the reason I'm showing it is because I want everybody watching to give yourself some freaking mercy, and this is the process. If you are impatient, which I tend to be impatient, you're going to be, okay, Peter told me this, and you want to be at stage four like tomorrow. Sorry, dude. That's, that's not the way it works. Um, some of you, the, the technical change on hand, you can maybe do it if you're lucky in two or three days. Sometimes it might be a one- or two-month project. It should not be a year-long project, in my opinion. If, if you're doing a year-long project, chances are you're, you're sabotaging by competing and giving up and only dabbling in the change. All right, so enough of that. Uh, video analysis. Why do I like it and why do I think even tomorrow you should go video beforehand? Uh, most of us are visual learners. Uh, it's huge for diagnosing errors. And when you see these checkpoints, I, I'm going to – recommend that you do it so you can compare yourself and it helps to see progress like oh yeah this is me last week and this is me this week okay these are the two apps i have coaches eye on my phone unfortunately they're not supporting it anymore but i still use it to this day i can draw on it and stuff you can't buy it anymore and then on form is another one and frankly there's a whole bunch and honestly you can just use your phone without any you know i can take a video and just scrub it back and forth and show a student, you know, the, their, you know, back and forth or stroke. Okay. Um, imagine, I just put this up here. This is a young boy who went to my class, or class, and he got a video. This is just images from that video, but me talking and drawing and showing him the nine checkpoints. Do you think that was maybe helpful to that kid when he could see him and like, oh, and Jorge's talking over that? All right, here we go. This is what we're here for, <clears throat> the checkpoints. I'm Vita Azarenka because I have a sweet video of her. So here we go. Um, checkpoint one. Again, the checkpoints are stuff I came up with with the help of Mark and some other smart people. Uh, we call it unit turn. Okay, so what do you look for in particular? A couple bullet points. Uh, the player uh, shoulder should be turned, the racket to the side. The non-hitting hand should stay attached for the most part or close to being attached. I'm looking at that circle there, and this is pretty common. Eyes forward, chest to the side. Okay, this is pretty much the checkpoints that I look for. Then the next checkpoint, I call it the load. Uh, and what I mean by that, look at her leg. The weight is on that leg is bent. Uh, and the weight is mostly on the back foot. You can look really closely at her front foot and see that it's not weighted. It's just barely touching. Uh, there's some uh, air there. Okay, so that's the load. She loads on the back foot. Okay. So this was, let's go back. This is a unit turn. Now she loads. And now I look at the racket. It's usually up here. And then we do explode. Load, explode. Load, explode. See how the weight transfers to the front foot now? So that, that has gone that way. The racket drops into that area. And then we go to checkpoint four, which is the point of contact. I always make a little line straight down from where it is. Almost always the best four hands that's out in front. Okay, uh, this next point, number five, is the most messed up. I don't have scientific proof, but over the years of videotaping, it's called extension. Uh, this is the one that my students, at least, get wrong the most. So after the extension, you want to see the arm straighten out, not chicken wing across the ribs, but out towards the target. 
Uh, she does pretty good. She's got a bend in her arm. You can see her racket's good three three feet ahead of her face, right? So it's not immediately over. And some people trying to hit topspin don't do that so well. Uh, a checkpoint five is the finish. Uh, what I would say about the fit, you can see in this example, she finished over the shoulder. The finish is super misleading because everybody has opinions on, well, you shouldn't finish here, you shouldn't finish there. Um, here's my thought. Uh, don't kill me if you don't like it. The finish is all determined now how you want to make the ball behave. So in other words, if Peter's at the net and he's closing tight, I'm going to hit a forehand. I'm probably going to finish from my pocket up and then towards my pocket because I'm trying to make the ball dip. Okay. And then that example, that's a good finish. If Peter was closing in and I was backing up, I might throw up a lob and I'm going to finish from my pocket to my hairdo like Rafa because I'm throwing up a ball. So you, the trajectory, how you want to make that ball dance and make that ball behave will change your finishes. We saw earlier, you know, Federer finishing here. He's driving that ball. And there's all sorts of finishes. So most finishes are correct. And if you, I, you could show me a finish on somebody, and I can almost for sure tell you the shot they hit. If I see this, I go, they just hit a dipper. If I see this, I go, they just hit a, a lob or a high bounding shot. If I see this, I go, they just stepped in the court and ripped one. So the finish, don't get too hung up on finishes because lots of finishes are correct. Okay, so those are the, the six real quick. Okay? Now, let's, uh, by the way, see our elbow? A lot of good forehands that elbows pointing at the opponent afterwards. So now recently <clears throat> comes this. New forehand. So when I started teaching tennis, the forehand was the classic forehand, kind of John Macrono, straight back, straight through. Then the modern forehand came. I'm not inventing these names. It's just what's out, in, you know, in the world where the tip is up, the paw, the paw, the hand goes down. Uh, and now there's this next gen forehand that a lot of like Kyrgios and Jack Sock and team are hitting. So I thought it would take a little bit of look at these two guys. I'm going to compare Federer here with Jack Sock. Okay, so obviously Jack Sock is not as good as Federer, but Jack Sock's forehand is notoriously good. He has a huge, humongous forehand. Uh, so if we compare the modern on the left, I'm just calling it modern forehand, next-gen forehand, uh, unit turn, what do you see? Okay, what I notice is the difference in the racket. And the, and the next-gen, the racket is pointing, the racket tip is pointing forward a lot and not so much up. Almost always in the in the next gen, it's more forward. Okay, so that's checkpoint one. Let's go to checkpoint two. And this is really freaky. Uh, look at Federer's racket, the string, or first look at their feet, right? This was the load. Remember how Vika had her weight in the back foot? Look at Jack's feet. He's not quite as separated, but he has more weight on the back foot. You can see the other toe is up on the, the other foot's on the toe. Now watch this. Look at where the strings of Federer racket is down. That's very classically a modern forehand. And now you can't quite tell this, but believe it or not, that's the hitting side of Jack Sock's racket. That's the side of the strings he's going to hit with. And it's pointing absolutely backwards and up. It's way different. Uh, and are we going to tell Jack Sock, this is technically wrong, Jack. You can't do it this way. I don't know. I'm, I'm hoping to just kind of get people to think, you know, maybe what I learned today from Jorge is like there, there's some ranges here that might they might all work. OK, checkpoint three, we call that the explode. This is we're looking for that weight transfer. You see a big difference here. Jack. Uh, uh, yeah. Sock on the right. He doesn't he's not as classically coiled. Right. He's kind of his feet are kind of straight and he's just doing it like in his hips and his body. Another thing I noticed at this checkpoint with these two is their elbows. Look at the difference in the elbow. So Jack Sock has faced his palm back, and now he's cranking, and he's doing all this amazing amount of arm nastiness, uh, which probably a lot of us, would our arm would fall off if we did that. But that's checkpoint three, the explode. You see it happen right in front of your face. Uh, then you got point of contact, so we highlight that. You see... Federer's point, that red line straight down, but way out in front. Uh, Jack, less so, but that's because it's next gen and he's open stance and it can be a little deeper. Uh, so you can see the difference there. Checkpoint five, the difference here is extension. 
So look at Federer, known for having beautiful extension. That arm is as straight as it can get. No chicken wing here. You, look at the distance between his hat and the tip of his racket. That's a good freaking four or five feet. It's way out there. None of this little, you know, stuff like that. Look at Jack Sock, who's more notorious for, like, turning the knob and making it more this way and less that way. Uh, you can see a difference there. Uh, and then you have the finish. Okay, so I look. Look at that. One is not even on the other side of the body. Fed had, You can see Fed's back. And you see Jack's chest. Okay, so what's the whole point of all that? Um, that there's many ways to hit a forehand. Uh, you should use some, you know, remember I didn't say there's no range of acceptability. There's a range that's acceptable. Not everything's acceptable. But way too many, I guess my message would be way too many of us are that range is nothing. Like, I got to look at, like, Fed. Maybe you shouldn't be hitting a Fed. Maybe you should be hitting a, a, a Jack Sock or something else. Okay, so what are the takeaways here? Because I want to have a few questions for people. Um, range of acceptability is super important. Um, skill acquisition and how you go through those modes, major important. If I had to give you an assignment, I know some of you will do it. Probably most of you won't. But I would say videotape yourself. Everybody videotape beforehand. Now that you know these six things, scrub your thing and see if you find something. You could also do it with a coach. I mean, I'm a coach. I love giving coaches business, and they, they should be able to diagnose you and help you. But you can do this on your own if you can't get a coach. Uh, and then lastly, you got to be super careful with the addiction uh, to technique. Um, you know, obviously, we all want to have great technique and better technique, but the person that wins a tennis match is not – always the person with the best technique it's it's like 50 50 half of the tennis matches i've experienced the person with worse technique wins because they have all these other skills mental and movement and strategy so it's one pillar it's not the only pillar can't build your game on one pillar so that's kind of my thoughts and i'd love to hear what people think um about those checkpoints and i'll answer any questions if you if you want Wow, that was really, really good. All right, I'm going to bring you back uh, to us here so we can chat a little bit because that was really, really awesome. Let me um, just make sure I get this right. Move from the stage back. You there? Uh -oh. oh, right here I am. Okay, cool. I muted myself for a cough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. So first of all, if you have questions, now's a good time to ask them. Um, and I think – one thing too that's important that you were going through is that you know you have Jack Sock and then you have Roger Federer and they have different styles in their forehand because they're also doing different things with their forehand. They hit the ball kind of differently. They have you know kind of different signature shots in a way. They can they can hit the same shots but in a way they're they're different, right? I mean playing against a Federer forehand is different than a Jack Sock forehand. So and their styles match what the ball does when it comes off. So I think that's also important, don't you? It's like if you're going to go after a certain style, kind of go after a style that you're kind of more natural to in the style play that you like to do. Right. Yeah, cause, so like Rafa's finishes, you know, being that's pretty unique to him, right? Um, more people are doing that. But he has a very violent game. He swings hard. I mean, pretty much every swing, he's swinging for the fences. He's not hitting singles. He's hitting home runs. Like, every swing is a killer. So that game needs a lot of safety, a lot of safety. Or he'd be hitting balls out of bounds all the time. So he puts safety with topspin. So this is why it's that way. If you're Federer, you don't finish. I've seen Federer finish up here plenty, but it's not like every other shot because he's more linear, and he's probably miles per hour may not be – um, it's, it's hard of a forehand as uh, Rafa, but it isn't much difference because he's more through it, and, and uh, Rafa's more violently at topspin. Of course, it bounces high, and then it's crazy. We, we do have a good question here. Bruce says, okay, Jorge, so if my technique is not perfect and I still desire to win matches, which other skills should I lean into the most until I improve my technique um, so I would love to, I got a general answer. And then I would say, if I can look at, especially if I know the person and I know their game, I can come up with very specific, like I know 
Kyle. I don't know if Kyle's still on here. But if I if Kyle, because I know Kyle's game, he's at my college. And I can say, if Kyle said to me, okay, tell me two or three things in my game that I, I can help me win more. I know it. So since I don't know Bruce personally, I could say this. Don't give up on the technique. Don't stop chasing better technique. Don't be a maniac on it either. So I would say this is very Jorge comment. It's sabotage. Your ability to make the other guy not play so good. As a matter of fact, later, for those that join us, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But um, what I mean, Peter, is uh, very few students that I start working with, I hope to make them better, and a lot of them get it, some don't, is uh, they think tennis is about me. It's about my side of the net. And if I'm going to have a good day, it's going to all be based on me playing well. i got to keep my level high. Uh, well, tennis is a game of exchange. There's two sides of the court. And I always argue that the very best players are less concerned about them and they're more concerned with the opponent. So they're not just like, oh, my stroke, oh, my, I didn't hit that. They Instead, they're like, not my side. They look over there and say, oh, there's Peter. He's a lefty. He does this. I bet if he's got one, and they start to and they do everything based on that side of the net. So sabotage means deliberately playing away and delivering shots that make the other guy uncomfortable. So that will depend. It's, it's per person, right? Because maybe I hit hard and that makes Kyle uncomfortable. But if I hit hard, and maybe Peter loves it. So I first got to figure out what that is. And then I got to have the skill to deploy whatever I find out. So maybe I find out, you know what? Do you have a one-hander, Peter, or a two-hander? I have a one-hander. You used to have a two-hander yeah. as a junior. Yeah. So right off the gate, if I was coaching against you, I would say, okay, why don't you try to do what Rafa does and hit loopier balls up to Peter's, you know, get him hitting one-handers up above the backhand. All right. You're not very allowed to cut the line matches. Very few one-handers will say, oh, I love the ball above my shoulder. Okay. So that's an example of, of playing in a way that's sabotaging, uh, slicing, drop shotting. These are all things, you know, for years I've been – coaching at tournaments i mean many many years and i've had plenty of my kids and adults lose matches and they come off and when they complain there's always certain styles they hate to play they're universally hated they hate playing moon ballers they hate playing hackers they hate playing slicers and drop shotters those i mean those are three classics right i hate the moon baller i hate the drop shotter i hate the hacker uh so if we hate it that much I say those are the first three skills you should learn to deploy. Like, if you don't have a drop shot in today's game where 99% of singles matches, your opponent prefers to play from the baseline, certain volley is, like, almost a stink. I, I can watch a 4-0 match at the Nationals USTA, and there's going to be one guy that serves in volleys. Everybody plays from the baseline. I mean, the whole world does it. So if, if you know that, how is a drop shot not in everybody's arsenal? Because it wrecks everybody. A good drop shot. You don't have to be athletic to learn it. It's just a hand shot. So this is kind of what I want people to do. Get off your own horse. Think about what will make you um, – it's not so much about you winning as much as you allowing the other guy to lose and forcing them to lose. Mm. There's a, a couple of questions here, but we actually got to soon wrap this up to get over to the members only. We're having a members only live stream. All right. Um, emailed them today. We have 500 members plus, so we don't know how many are going to show up for the live stream, so we don't be late for them. But uh, one was, do you offer any camps and the like? And actually, Jorge, and then he can tell you what else he does. But um, last year, we did the first Tennis Con Live at Innisbrook Resort. Jorge was there. Ryan yeah. Reedy from Two Minute Tennis was there. Gigi Fernandez, Kevin Garlington, John Craig, Jeff Greenwald. It's, it's basically like bringing the tennis con off of the internet, not in the tennis court. And um, that's one reason why you want to upgrade because one of you is going to go for free. People paid $34.50 for it. Um, Heidi, if you want to apply, you can go to that website. You'll see it on all our free days. We've got banners there. And uh, right now you can get $900 off if you apply. Uh, one more question, and then we're going to get into kind of wrapping this up. Uh, how do you develop – your serve development with regard to consistency, target, technique, power. Let, that's a, there's a lot to that. Maybe just wrap that one up quick. Um, want me to go? Yeah, uh, you so go. When it comes to serve, 
Um, I just gave the speech at seven o'clock here. There's two phases of your serve, okay? You got to get your technique as good as you can. There's nine checkpoints on the serve. You should have most of them under control. Not perfect, but you know, you can't have like horrible technical flaw, okay? But as soon, as soon as your technique is not even perfect, but good enough, then you shift gears and you start thinking serve strategy. So when people say, well, what do you mean by serve strategy? Serve, I think of technique as a real technical shot, lots of moving parts. I take private lessons forever on the serve. Um, and, you know, I think that's important. But the strategy, and I ask kids sometimes, tell me what do you mean, what do you think I mean by serve strategy? And they have a blank face. So strategy and the serve is this. A server, every server, should be able to do three things. You should be able to direct the left or right. Okay, that's important. You should be able to direct fast or slow, change your speed. And you should be able, this is the hardest one, to change high and low. So in other words, I can serve so my opponent hits the ball chest high. I can also serve so he hits it above his um, head and also below. So if you can do those three things, not necessarily power, but I can make sure I go left or right so I can pick on the weaker side. I can change my pitches so it's not just 88 miles an hour every time the guy grooves it. And I can change some heights. Man, you are a really good server. Um, so that's the way I look at it. I think it's a three-pronged approach. Most people that are struggling on the serve, they're chasing only one of those things, power. I want to take my head miles per hour. Uh, and if that's the case, then the fastest server would be the best player in the world, and we know there it's not. So mm. that's kind of how I would answer that. No, very cool. Guys, um, what we're going to do now is we are going to transition towards telling you if you want to, how to join us over at nine o'clock in the members stream. So if you are a member, all you gotta do is log into your membership and let me just go here inside the membership just so I can show you what it looks like. Uh, I'm gonna just put this in solo layout just so people know how to get to us uh, where, hey. Sure. So um, yeah, this is, this is basically your lifetime access membership, okay? And people were confused the other day although I thought it was pretty clear, when you go into your membership, you just click here, and that's going to bring you to the 9 o'clock live stream. Can you still hear me, Jorge? Yes, I can. Okay, okay, okay. I thought I just heard something different. Okay, so if you just click there, you will join the members-only live stream. You, you log into your membership. And then also, one thing Jorge was talking about before was, you know, do the importance of video analysis. And, and again, not enough people are taking advantage of this. I am offering free video analysis for a year <laughs> when you sign up and get your lights. I mean, that's literally a $3,000 value. I mean, you can look at some other online coaches and they're, they're charging like four or $500 a month, which they should. I shouldn't do this for free, really. Um, but when you, you come here and you just like, look, because people are like, well, how do I do it? You just literally click on the video, request permission, give it permission, allow, and this thing's going to fire up. And then see that now the camera's there. I could basically record myself and send it to myself. I'm not going to do that, but that's that's literally how simple it is. And that's th the first thing inside your membership. And then also, if you love these live streams, we got Monday through Friday. But one of the bonuses here, and I've, I added um, yesterday, I added about 13, 14 of our live streams are in there. And this live stream too. If you like this presentation, you want to watch it again, it's going to go in the members area tomorrow morning. So all this that we've gone through so far, you can see it's all it's all there, guys. So um, and and Jorge tonight has has some bonuses for you, too. That I'm going to let him talk about. Are you ready? Yes. All right. So I'm going to come back. So I have put Jorge's link into. Um, into the chat in case you're not a member. If you're already a member, you just simply go there at 9 o'clock. All right, so um, Jorge's got some special bonuses. Why he's getting his bonuses ready for you guys. I'm going to give away 10 of these tonight for the first 10 people that sign off uh, up tonight off Jorge's link. I'm going to send this out to you. So make sure when you sign up, email me your address because you're going to get this. And then it is Tal Tuesdays, baby. It's not Tal Wednesday. It's Tal Tuesday. So you're also going to get 
this when you upgrade tonight. And also, if you're already a member and you're on the live stream, I like to reward people on the live stream who are members. Just, again, send me an email with your address and I'll send it to you. I don't want you to feel left out or cheated. You're on the live stream. You're dedicated. Okay. And now we're going to go to Jorge's bonuses right here. Yes. Uh, and there you go. All right. So here's the bonus. Obviously, so let me talk a bit about Tennis Con first, Peter. So all of you watching, I'm certain you get emails up from Peter, from me, from me, and, uh, you know, all the online coaches. And it's kind of a collaborative community. There's a couple times a year where we have these events like this one and Maribond's Tennis Files and the Summit, where it's really a no-brainer because you get to watch everything literally for free. If you never upgrade, you should at minimum take the free training. Uh, but the, the point is that if you do upgrade, it's unbelievable for what you get to have 40-some lessons. So uh, all of us give a bonus uh, so to incentivize you to buy through our link. Uh, so here's what I came up with for the bonus for this year's Tennis Con 7 if they buy through my link. Uh, it's a course I created. Uh, you can see it right here on the screen. It's called Overcoming uh, Pre-Match Nerves. So, Peter, you probably know on my Tennis Girls website, I have 140 courses. I, I could have picked any one. So the reason I picked this one is because, to me, 90% of the people would say, mm, I have some issues varying degrees. I am paralyzed by pre -match nerves. I'm 50-50. I get a little bit of it. But almost everybody, there's not that many tennis players, at least in my orbit, that say, no, before the match, I'm just, I have no issues. I never have. I never will. That's not normal. Okay. So if you've ever competed and you've had struggles, like if, frankly, if you don't, then this is probably not the bonus for you. Um, so what I've done here. I've had more than my share of students that struggle with pre-match nerves. When I was young, and I started tennis late, I started competing right away, I, I mean, I would almost throw up before a match. Uh, once the match got going, I settled down quite a bit. And if I was ahead, I really settled down. If I was behind, it took me longer to settle down. But, I mean, I remember matches where I'm, like, sick to my stomach uh, because I think it's, like, the end of the world if I don't play well in the stupid tennis match. But... Um, so what you're going to find in here is about 15 lessons. Um, this is just, you know, normal course. So you click a lesson, it plays over here. You click another lesson, it plays over there. Uh, the real definition of mental toughness, future versus past thinking, using mantras, why tennis is tough as for pre-match nerves, catastrophic thinking, repurposing competition, the four pillars. So these are all the things that I picked when I teach someone that's really struggling with this. <laughs> these are just lessons that I <laughs> developed and taught my own students over 41 years of coaching. Um, I'm certain that it will help most of you, uh, but that's what the bonus is if, if they buy it. You'll get lifetime access to my Overcoming pre nerves course, and that's a little bit of a sneak peek of what's inside it. A little bit of what we talked about today, but mostly new stuff that we haven't talked about today. Mm -hmm. That's great. All right. Yeah. I think um, as competitors, this is the best I can do for you. Yeah, absolutely. And then, um, Jorge, I'm going to bring you back. So, guys, when you go off Jorge's link, I'll put the uh, I'll put the link one more time in there. You're going to you're going to get that. But uh, right now, I want to transition to the membership because what we're going to do here is we're going to go and we're going to talk about corrective now because he said it's easy to figure out what you're doing wrong but it's hard to correct it so at nine o'clock for our members we're going to go into corrective techniques so what is th what is oh. that all about jorge well let me share i'm glad you brought that up so i'm going to share a little bit uh let me okay. let me get my stuff going here uh let me know when you can put that up because i want people to kind of yeah, and I want to put this here too. So you got my towel today in the mail. It's a great towel. All right, Sam, very cool. Um, so I don't see it yet. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Let me uh, screen share, and I'll pick that bad boy. And also, guys, tonight, if you are a member or you become a new member and you can't figure out how to log into your membership, 
Always remember to email me at crunchtimecoaching at gmail. And if for some reason you missed tonight's live stream, again, the replay is going to be there forever. So hopefully you'll join us at 9 o'clock. But even if you can't join us, that it will still live in the membership. Go ahead. What are we talking about 9 o'clock? Okay. So now we're going to shift gears. Now you know the chat and the checkpoints. That's the diagnosis part. The harder part, in my opinion, is the correction. So here's what we're going to do. Let's see if I can get this to go forward. There's three types of errors we're going to talk about what they are but really we're going to spend most of the time there and then here's the actual 13 videos that we're going to look at um how to fix an improper point of contact a, a too risky forehand unable to hit toss and short follow through falling off the back foot these are all very common ones uh, and we're gonna if you join us at nine i'm going to open up videos i'll probably mute it and talk over it and show it to you i don't want you to just watch the video i want to elaborate on it but uh you know there's more <laughs> things that go wrong on the forehand than 13 but these are 13 pretty common ones maybe you recognize some of these but i'm going to show you how, how i have been fixing and still fix these issues on a you know corrective technique as you will uh and hopefully some of some of you that might struggle with some of these uh, will find it useful yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely. I think everybody should tune in just for the improper spacing. I do lots of cl clinics. People travel from literally all over the, the globe to come take some camps with me. And I mean, <laughs> almost everybody has bad spacing, especially on the forehand. And then the backhand, it's tough, too, because, you, you know, you don't have even that, that offhand to help you guide it. So this is going to be a really great session. Uh, we look forward to seeing you there. This is going to be a session to where it's going to be more of an intimate crowd. We had basically 100, a little over 100 on tonight at our peak. So there's going to be less people who are members who are actually going to still be, you know, on with us at 9 o'clock. So you can almost get like a, a private lesson, if you will. So we didn't answer your question tonight uh, on this live stream because it kind of went through quickly even though we still pretty much spend an hour with you, you'll get a better chance uh, in the members. Because uh, lots of times we do the members right now, we're getting 15 to 30 members in there. So it's it's definitely a, a more relaxed atmosphere and you'll be able to ask more questions and where he's going to go through this. So guys, we've got to run. I'm going to put the link in just one more time in case you're not seeing it. And then uh, Jorge and I got to get over to the membership. And if you're, a, if you're trying to become a member and you can't figure out how to log in, again, send me an email to crunchtimecoaching at gmail.com. And uh, worst case scenario, if you can't get in tonight, most people do get in. But if you're one of those people like, I can't figure out how to get in, you know, don't worry. It's going to be there. The video will be there forever. Okay. All right. That's it. Anything else, Jorge? No, guys. Thanks for joining. I hope you got some good, helpful hints out of there. Okay. We're going over the membership right now. We'll see you guys there. All right. Take care.